Tecmo. Just the mere mention of the name is bound to give the warm fuzzies to any retro gamer. Whether it was spinning footballs in Tecmo Bowl or spinning roundhouse kicks in Ninja Gaiden, you knew that if you were playing a Tecmo game, chances are the quality was very high. In today's episode, we are going to talk about an earlier Tecmo arcade release by the name of Rygar. Well, what's the backstory on the creation of this arcade game? Well, what was the inspiration for the deadly disc armor? Well, let's find out as we learn about the history of Rygar. The year is 1985 and Tecmo designer Hideo Yoshizawa is looking for ideas for his next arcade game. He was always interested in Japanese mythology and wanted to create an action game based around these fantastical elements. He wanted to incorporate mutant versions of real animals, as well as creating brand new creatures looking as if they had escaped from the bowels of hell. Rather than use a typical sword or knife as found in other action arcade games, he wanted something entirely different that would help it stand out. This time, he drew inspiration from a childhood toy, the yo-yo, and more specifically, the windmill trick. This became your primary weapon, which was a long chain and a shield attached to it, otherwise known as the disc armor. You can fire it horizontally, directly at the enemy, or spin it 360 degrees around yourself. You have a jump button and a fire button, and you better be on your toes because the action is fast and furious. The official story goes, 4.5 billion years have passed since Earth's creation. Many dominators have ruled in all their glory, but time was their greatest enemy, and it defeated their reign. And now, a new dominator's reign begins. Rygar was released in 1986 by Tecmo. The game takes place across 27 levels, but a lot of them were unusually short. As I mentioned, your primary weapon is your disc armor, but you'll need a fast finger to get the job done. That's what she said. Because this is another one-hit wonder game. You will encounter all sorts of nefarious creatures, including rhinos, lava men, giant frogs, griffins, giant bats, the grim reaper, giant monkeys, and giant worms, among others. All throughout the game, headstones appear which can be destroyed. Sometimes in the wreckage you will find shield power-ups and bonuses. There are five different upgrades including three for your disc armor. The star shield increases the range of your weapon. The crown enhances the power of your shield. And the sun icon gives you better vertical control which is useful for taking out flying enemies. The tiger icon enables you to kill the enemies you jump on. And if you collect the cross symbol it will give you invulnerability for a brief time. Taking a page out of a certain plumber's playbook, you can jump on your enemy's head and stun them briefly. If you make it to level 13, be on the lookout for the million point bonus. It is well hidden though. At the end of each level, you will enter a room which will tally up your bonuses based on how many enemies were killed, how much time was used, etc. In each of these rooms is a statue of a man in a thong which made me think I was playing a Choaniki game. These hunky beefcakes aren't just here for the eye candy though, oh no. They are holding icons which are clues to the power-ups for the upcoming level. The game does allow you to continue up until level 20. If you manage to make it through all 27 levels, you'll find yourself face to face with the evil dominator. He is extremely easy to defeat and once you do, you will be thrown up in the air repeatedly. The graphics and animation are fantastic with excellent use of parallax scrolling all throughout the game. The music has a nice ominous tone and sounds great especially in the heat of the battle. The sound effects are your typical grunts and groans and fit in with the rest of the gameplay perfectly. The game itself is fast and the controls are nice and responsive. The game was a moderate success but that didn't stop the onslaught of conversions. Probe Software were in charge of the home computer versions and some of them turned out okay. Others, well, I'll just let you be the judge. The first port we are looking at is the Spectrum version. 
The graphics are nice and detailed with a fair amount of color sprinkled throughout. There is very little color clash which is always a good thing. According to the original programmer Anthony Hartley, Tecmo supplied them with an actual arcade unit and the source code for the game. This would explain why the graphics looked as close to the arcade game as they did. Due to memory constraints, a lot of the enemies are missing along with the gorgeous backgrounds. The speed of the game is very close to the arcade original and the playability is pretty good despite only having one fire button. The abstract version was also programmed by Anthony Hartley and it looks pretty good. Apparently the game now takes place on the moon because when your player jumps, he is in the air for about 45 seconds. The sprites are nice and detailed with excellent use of color. We also have music from the arcade game which sounds really good. The gameplay is good but the overall speed lets it down. The game runs at about 80% of the arcade original. The trusty but perhaps rusty Commodore 64 version is up next. Unfortunately, it's only average at best. The speed of the game is way too fast, sometimes a bit too fast, with lots of enemies on screen at once. Once again, we only have one fire button to use against the onslaught of enemies, so the controls do take a bit of getting used to. The graphics are varied and detailed, but the colors are extremely muddy. Also missing are the gorgeous backgrounds. The music, unfortunately, is not that memorable. I've come to expect much more from the beloved Sid Chip. It does play pretty well, but it's very difficult. The Sega Master System is a decent conversion, although it is stripped down from the arcade original. This was only released in Japan under the name Argus no Jujikin. Thankfully, we get two fire buttons this time around, which makes the controls much more manageable. This is more of a direct port of the arcade unit, unlike the NES version which I will talk about later in this video. Instead of 27 short stages, the game has been streamlined into 5 long stages. The headstones are missing but are replaced by flying bonuses. The graphics are detailed with colorful sprites but a lot of the backgrounds are missing. Sound effects and music are pretty good and reminiscent of the arcade game. The gameplay feels like Rygar, although it can get a bit irritating at times due to the collision detection. The best home port that was released here in the States is the Atari Lynx version. This is a straight up faithful conversion of the arcade game despite only having 23 levels. The graphics are large and detailed which is a bit of a hindrance on the small screen. The viewpoint is zoomed in making it difficult to see where your enemies are at. Finally we have nice detailed backgrounds and excellent use of parallax scrolling. The controls are nice and responsive and thanks to the two buttons found on the Atari Lynx handheld, the playability is great. The sound effects and music are really good with a nice rendition of the arcade theme. Also, for the first time in any version of the game, the statues wearing thongs make an appearance. That right there gives this version a big thumbs up. The NES version is what most retro gamers are familiar with. It was developed by Tecmo and is basically a completely different game. Instead of a straightforward side-scrolling action game, this is a more open-ended action adventure similar to Metroid. The further into the game you progress, the more of the world opens up for you to explore. 
There are various weapon power-ups to obtain similar to the arcade game. The graphics resemble the arcade game as does the sound. Even though this is a mixture of action and RPG, there are no save states nor a password feature. So if you want to beat the game, you'll have to do it all in one sitting. I would have preferred a straight up conversion of the coin op myself, but I still enjoyed playing this version. One thing of interest is that there is a bug in the PAL version. This substantially increases the difficulty of the last couple of levels. Not to the point where it's completely unbeatable, but it is much more difficult. The X68000 version is almost identical to the arcade original. This is without a doubt the best home version of Rygar. The graphics are nicely detailed with the same silky smooth parallax scrolling. The sound effects and music are excellent and seems as if they were ripped straight from the arcade original. The controls are nice and responsive and feels like Rygar. There is even an option in the menu to increase your number of lives and also the number of continues. Another stellar conversion for the X68000. The arcade version was released on the PlayStation Network and the Wii Virtual Console. The game was also released as part of the Tecmo Classic Arcade compilation for the Microsoft Xbox. In 2002, Rygar The Legendary Adventure was released for the PlayStation 2. This took full advantage of the system's 3D capabilities and gave us an excellent hack and slash adventure. The story is much more fleshed out in this version which also gives us some awesome cutscenes. The disc armor returns and it's a joy using it in full 3D. The core gameplay remains the same with these slashing rocks and headstones and collecting power-ups. The music and sound effects are fantastic and really set the tone for the rest of the game. The switch to 3D has not hurt this game in the slightest. The controls are intuitive, but the most important thing is that the game is fun. Six years later, this was ported over to the Nintendo Wii and released as Rygar The Battle for Argus. And that just about wraps up the history of Rygar. Most people are familiar with the NES version, but the original coin op is what started my love for the game. It's a fun little slice and dice adventure that gets ridiculously hard the more you play. Give it a try and you'll see what I mean. If you like this video and want to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Also, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to my content. It only takes a few seconds and I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching.